Michigan was not the first state to ban affirmative action in college admissions. The first was California, where voters decided in 1996 to ban the use of race-based preferences at public colleges. And since then, the percentage of black students at flagship University of California schools has dropped. At UCLA, only 3.8% of undergraduate students are African American. At Berkeley, 3%. The result, according to some students, is a hostile, isolating atmosphere. To draw attention to that argument, members of UCLA's Black Law Students Association recently published a video in which students of color describe their experiences at the law school, where just 33 out of about 1,100 students are African American. I'm in a room of 80 people, just sitting by myself, and everywhere I look, no one can help me. No one can jump in. No one can at least acknowledge what I'm saying has any truth. Joining us now from Los Angeles is Jelani Cotton and Asia Womack, who you just saw in that clip. They are the current co-chairs of the Black Law Students Association at UCLA. Thanks so much for being here, you two. Thank you, Thank for, you having for having us. us. So, um, Jelani, I'll start with you. So, as we debate affirmative action, it's important for us to think of how diversity or the lack thereof affects actual students. So how do you see a lack of diversity as hurting you and fellow students of color? I think it has tremendous effects um, on my ability to learn in class. It's, it's, it's not normal. It's a not normal conditions to go to school under, really. If you think about going and being the only black person in a class of over 100 students, it it really affects your ability to learn. There's this, this situation where you feel hyper visible, but also invisible. Mm -hmm. You feel hyper visible because in a lot of ways you're tokenized. Um, when issues of race come up in a classroom, which they do often because it's the law, uh, I, you often feel made, you, you, you're made to feel like you have to really comment on those issues. Mm -hmm. But then you feel invisible at the same time because the dominant culture is so different from what you feel. So you don't, I really don't feel like I see myself reflected a lot of time in the students, in the faculty, and in the way that I think and I experience life. Um, I'm often the only black student in classrooms. In my 1L class section, I was one of two black students, and uh, I was the only black woman. So when issues of gender came up, when issues of race came up, I often felt like people looked to me to talk, but then at one point got tired of me talking so much about those issues. Mm. And I felt like if there were more students of color, more black women, more black people in the classroom, mm -hmm. there, people could have seen a variety of experiences, first of all, but also right. I wouldn't have had the burden of always feeling like I had to speak up. Right. Asia, let's broaden this out and talk about all students. How is this detrimental to all students, to white students? Well, really, the study of the law in particular uh, has a lot to do with what will happen in the future. So many of my classmates will go on to be judges, prosecutors, uh, and leaders in, in politics. And so when you lack a foundation of really understanding uh, issues from so many different points, you are not able to go out into the, to the world and really have effective change that will, that will really help the, the country. Uh, there are several prosecutors that I'm sure if they were able to sit in a more di diverse classroom, they would have a different perspective mm -hmm. on a lot of things that are happening now. Let me bring the conversation here to the table and, and, and Hallie a a ask you, what are the benefits to a diverse student body, the, uh, the detriments of a, of a homogenous student body? Yeah, I think it's an educational and it's also an economic issue in the country. So. It's important to have a diverse student body, partly so that you have a critical mass of students who are part of minority groups, so that there is this feeling of community and support, and so that students don't feel like they have to represent their group. And that's also important for all students there. That's how you counter stereotypes, by having enough diversity that students see a variety of experiences within different demographic groups. And this is also something that's important to encourage critical thinking for students. If you go to school with people who had the same experiences you did, 
you're not being challenged in the same way to communicate and think about your ideas and really be prepared to enter a diverse workforce. You know, Raul and, and Judith, Judith, we're talking about, about law school here. So mm -hmm. how important is it right. that the next generation yeah. of lawyers and politicians, that they're diverse? Well, first, I mean, I just I want to thank the people, the students at UCLA. I was the national chair of the National Black Law Students Association um, when I was in law school, and I know how difficult it is. I went to Columbia. I was one of 34 in my class, and I know that in, you know, in our profession, first year, you're reading cases that are about property and about the Constitution and always squarely fit a discussion about race, and professors don't often, you know, include you in that conversation, but you have to bear the burden of it. Right. So, um, uh, Asia and Jelani, I want to get the last question to you. And, and since that video, what has been the reaction on campus to the video? Um, there's been a lot of uh, negative backlash, as well as people, of course, coming out to support us. But on our actual campus, there has been a lot of negative backlash. We've had students receive hate mail mm. uh, in their mailbox. A student who was in the video got a, a letter in her mailbox uh, telling her to, you know, stop being a sensitive N-word. Um, we had our posters and flyers ripped down off of the boss or board. Uh, I think the environment at the school, which was very hostile uh, before uh, racially and uh, isolating it it continued but it intensified after the video huh. because it like it brought up all of the issues to the forefront and we had a lot of pushback from students who uh, were not black students but who had an opinion about whether what we were saying was true whether uh, our experiences in a way we felt was really accurate Wow. I mean, it was, uh, and it, it was an immediate black backlash that was very similar to what we experience in in class, but more overt. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, and it really shows. Before Prop 209 was enacted, there were 46 black students in the first year class alone, mm -hmm. and now we're there, and they tell us that you know 11 is remarkable, and that we should feel good about that. Uh, these these low numbers are not normal, and what they do is they, they breathe this environment where it's okay mm -hmm. to, to leave hate mail or it's okay to be harassed mm -hmm. in, in the middle of school. Well, um, well, go ahead. J Jelani Cotton and Asia Womack in, in Los Angeles, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and thank you very much for, for doing that video and, and, and taking a stand. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Coming up, the challenge of creating diversity without considering race. What will it mean for the future of affirmative action? That's next.